Hello, and welcome to the session of Oracle Machine Learning Office Hours. Uh, today's topic is going to be Machine Learning 102, Regression, uh, with Marcos Aaron Sevilla and uh, myself, Mark Hornick. We'll mention first the upcoming session and uh, then get right to the speaker. And if you have any questions that you'd like to ask, you can do so during the session in the Q&A section, uh, or uh, we can ask uh, them at the uh, end of the session as well. The next session is scheduled for August 25th, and the topic is Machine Learning 101 clustering. And so the idea here is that we're gonna talk about the terminology around clustering or segmentation and how to get uh, the data prepared, uh, how to measure cluster separation, uh, identify potential pitfalls, and you will also see some uh, use cases for clustering as well. As always, if you'd like to like, learn more about Oracle Machine Learning, check out our website, uh, oracle.com slash machine dash learning. And if you would like to try out the autonomous database uh, with currently the SQL API, uh, you can do that through the always free uh, services with oracle.com slash cloud slash free. So without further ado, I'll pass it over to Marcos, who uh, will talk to us about uh, Machine Learning 102 regression with a series of uh, excellent uh, demonstrations and it'll take us through uh, solving an interesting problem uh, with regression. So Marcus, I'll release sharing to you. Thank you very much, Mark. Hi, everyone. Uh, thank you for joining us today. The last time on session 101, what we did was we checked basically what was machine learning regression, right? Exactly the history, terminology, data preparation. And the demo we did was basically based on one single attribute, right? So we had one predictor. So the idea today is that we're gonna see multiple attributes, right? So we have multiple input attributes that are gonna be helping us to try to predict uh, the arrival delay of the flights. So we're gonna go through a few sections. I separated these sections um, and I created notebooks that are specific to these. So we're going to evaluate first the data preparation. Um, we did that part of that the last time. We're going to go a little deeper this time because of uh, that we're going to use now all the variables possible. Then we're going to go into some data analysis um, and try to understand better whether that data actually help us to predict something, right? Uh, and and have some more of a, a understanding uh, of, that you will normally have um, like a domain expertise to try to really understand what, what is that you're trying to do. Then we're going to move into model build and, and diagnostics. So we're going to again build the models, but now pay a little more attention to things like coefficients and, and how these model, models are built. And then um, we're going to go to the auto ML. Uh, just like last time, we want to try to now feed all of the new uh, columns to AutoML, all these attributes, and see uh, how that um, AutoML fares in comparison. And then we're going to run the model explainability module as well. So that can help us explain and understand which one of these variables actually is the most important one or the key ones, right, uh, based out of any, any type of models. And then we're, we're going to end up with a few conclusions. So um, basically, uh, I will be doing the demo on ml 4 pi just like last time. And then we're going to go in through all of these um, specific uh, components. So OK, so basically, here we are on our first notebook. This is part one of four, data preparation. The uh, section then, what I did is I just listed here the different sections for each notebook that helps. Uh, you understand what we're doing. The first section then is the current notebook that you're looking at. We're gonna go see this description of the problem, uh, evaluate multiple attributes, right, for regression, and then go through uh, basic uh, data preparation and transformation. Uh, then we're gonna continue on notebook two with uh, data analysis. Then we're gonna go to the model build and then finally to um, auto ML and the explainability, okay? So first things first, um, again, as we talked about before, the data set, we um, are gonna use the same data set as before. So the, 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 basically the data set is right here. Uh, the contents 
again, we have a we have an ID there. We have year, month, day of month, day of week of the flight. We have a departure time. We have the scheduled departure time. We have arrival time, uh, scheduled arrival time, elapsed time, actual versus the scheduled as well. And then we have a few uh, other columns like unique carrier flight numbers, origin and destination and distance of the flight, whether the flight was canceled or diverted, um, departure delay and arrival delay. So we're gonna try to go and focus on arrival delay in minutes. And, and that's gonna be our, our, um, our key ingredient this time. So, uh, well, basically initialization, just loading the, the pandas, matplotlib and, and OML. Um, and auto ML as well. So uh, initial exploration of the data. So you can see that basically we do an OML sync again with the table, right? So I'm assuming this data set is a database table available for me. So I'm just syncing with it and I give it a name on time. That's my proxy name that I can use now in Python. I will review the contents of the data so I can see I have an ID, I have year, I have month, um, month is a numerical variable, as I can see here, uh, day of month, day of week, which also is numerical, right? So maybe that's a Sunday, right? Or, or Saturday, right? Day seven. So, uh, I see departure time and I have basically the hour and the minutes and the hour is in a 24 hour format. Um, I see the scheduled departure time. I see arrival time. I see scheduled arrival time, uh, the carrier flight number, um, actual elapsed time and scheduled elapsed time, the arrival delay that we're looking for, um, the departure delay, right? And then I have the origin um, airport, Las Vegas and, and the destination airport here. So, and the distance again, right? We canceled and diverted. So when we get simple statistics, um, the last time we talked a little bit about this, where we went to check for statistics, uh, and then we were thinking about uh, things like the arrival delay and departure delay, because back then we were really only interested on in these guys. And back then we concluded that these were kind of really extreme, right? So you, you're not expecting any um, flight to, to get uh, to a place 900 minutes before it was supposed to be there. So maybe that's, you know, crossing the line of a day time and then someone forgot and put the wrong date there. So some, something happened in that system. That's definitely a glitch. 906 minutes of delay is also a lot, right? So, uh, same thing as the departure, which, okay, th this guy even makes sense if you had that flight taking all of that time, right? As a, the maximum departure delay here. Um, but also departing 26 minutes ahead of time, uh, as we talked about before, it might only happen if the plane is full, you got everyone on board already, you know, and then you might be in, in a hurry or you might just say, well, we, we can just get out of here. So, uh, but still it's kind of like an exaggeration. So um, we're taking a look at that distribution first, but we're gonna come back to these because we're thinking about also all the other kinds of, uh, of data, right, that we have here. We have years from 1987 to 2014 here uh, in terms of date, year, right? So when we um, look at the cross correlation, now because I just let it run, it is now picking up things like year and month, day of week and day of month. And it doesn't really make sense right? Because correlation is a numerical relationship between two columns or two attributes, but there is no measure of correlation that can tell you, you know, uh, for example, day of week, right? So the day of week, uh, the, the number one day of week and the number, the, the, the day two or day three, right? The day three doesn't mean three times more than day one, right? So these are not really numerical things. You can't really call them numbers and use them to compute anything. So it doesn't make sense to have them as a numerical value here. So that's the first danger, right? We have to pay attention to these things because we can just, you know, we feel the urge of just throwing everything on a model and have the model try to solve it. 
uh, these are very dangerous things to do, right? Day of month is the same thing. So day 30 is not 30 times larger than day one, right? But if you try to create a, a model, a regression model, it's going to throw in a coefficient that multiplies day of month so any coefficient is going to say day 30 is 30 times more than day one. And these things do not make any sense. So that is very dangerous. Uh, even year here, right, of course, uh, and, and month. So the day, the, the month, again, numerically, right, does not make sense. So we got to be very careful with these kinds of things. I mean, things like arrival delay versus distance, it's okay. These are numbers that have ranges that makes sense, departure delay and arrival delay, okay? And I got an 86% relationship here, which makes sense, right? The, the more you delay your departure, very likely you're gonna be arriving late, right? So that, that, that makes a lot of sense. So we wanna take a look at this and understand the relationships of those um, variables. One basic thing we, we did the last time was looking at canceled and diverted flights just because we want to drop, right? We, we don't want to use any diverted and any canceled flights um, for sure, because we're gonna, you know, we're gonna definitely use only the flights that actually had arrivals, right? For us to measure. Uh, but anyway, let's take a look at um, arrival delay, right? And arrival delay, the last time we were looking at it, uh, you can see that there's definitely like this very way, you know, far away, um, uh, exceptions here, right? So these guys are uh, uh, completely out of the curve, right? So our our most, the, the largest number here we have is, is definitely here. That is this complete exception out of the way. Um, and I'm using here the uh, OML graphics. So these are the histogram and box plot that come directly built from the database data, right? Now I'm going to create a, a local copy of the data because I want to use matplotlib and plot things locally. But I put a warning here for you guys to, to have in mind, whenever you're doing these kinds of things, we have a sampling and we have a random sample component so that you take the proxy and you say, I want to sample that. And you can take, you know, give me 10% sampling, 5%, 1%. It depends on the data that you have on the database, right? Because I have only 10,000 records in my case, I'm pulling, you know, most everything, right? Almost all the, the data whatever the data they can give me. But uh, you might wanna be more careful depending on the volume of the data you're playing with. And, and that local data now, I can do things that are like the multiple histograms or multiple box plots or the, the scatter, right? The scatter matrix that I did the last time. And, and again, this helps me a little bit to, to try to quickly visualize if there are obvious things that have some relationship between them, right? Between those, those columns. But I'm going to try to understand a little better now and dive a little deeper on the column. So, for example, should I use the flight number, right? So, again, as a number, for sure, it doesn't make any sense, right? But even if I did not use number, should I use the flight number for my predictions? And when I look at that and I sort, so the numbers here are sorted by the count, then um, when, I, when I see these things, right, so I'm doing a cross tab sort values count, right? By, by basically descending. So when I look at this, well, it tells me that the, the, the flight with the most, right, the flight number with the most flights is only 14. And it's from 14 down to, you know, lots and lots of flights with just six and five, four flights, uh, right? So it, it might not make sense, right? I would, I would argue immediately that this, this does not really make sense. Not only that, right? Flight numbers might change from year to year. Um, you you might change, uh, or, or airplanes uh, flight numbers might be uh, canceled, right, over time. So, uh, on top of that, right, they're very very specific, only for one route, only for that time of day. So it's it's really a little data, right? So fourteen records at a time are not going to help me, right, um, identify. Um, and even if they did, right, it's going to be so specific that it might be really um, overwhelming. Not only that, whenever a new flight comes up, I will have no idea because there's no, you know, that flight number was not there in my model, right? So I wouldn't have no idea of identifying uh, or, 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 or estimating my delay, right? 
So that might not make a lot of sense. Um, origin, right? So origin and destination, right? E each of those guys, that makes more sense, right? So I have Atlanta and Chicago and Dallas and LA, Denver, Phoenix, San Francisco. So these guys are okay. We have a, a, a large number of, of flights um, that are originating from there. Probably uh, the destinations are going to be there as well. So this makes sense, right? This is a more healthy variable that I could potentially use. And what about carriers? Um, I think carriers is the same, right? So we have a large number of, of uh, flights for every carrier. So carriers are not uh, crazy. There might be some carriers with very little flights, but in general, you know, if carriers are important things, then our models should be able to detect and select, you know, a few, right? So, um, how do we then define what columns we're going to use for the project, right? So what I did here, I wrote some conclusions for you guys to have an idea again, but it's important for you to figure out, right? This is for every problem you find in life, you're going to have to identify the types of variables, the types of attributes that make sense. So in this case, uh, these are dates, right? But they are numeric. So we need to definitely convert these things to strings because otherwise, the models are gonna think, hey, this is a number, right? If this is a number, I can multiply this number, I can give it a coefficient and, and I'll be happy, right? So we wanna convert them to strings because it might make sense, right? That every year, day or weekday or month, right? They, they could have influence, right? You would expect that a, a certain month of the year, you might have more delays, but we don't know. So we wanna convert them into strings so that we can use them in a model. Um, departure time, that is okay, but if you want to get departure time in hours and minutes, that might be too, too specific, right? You now start getting too granular and maybe that's not going to help your model, right? Because then every flight departs at a, a time, an hour and a, and, a, and a minute that is different. And then it might, you know, you end up diluting all of the, the capabilities of the model. Maybe we can uh, create a new string that is just ours that can help us understand that. On the um, scheduled departure time, I don't think that helps a lot, especially it doesn't help you understand the arrival delay of a flight, right? Because you actually are using already the actual departure time. So we are assuming that I know the when the flight depart, departed. So I know if it departed late, right? So I know the departure hour, for example. So I don't need this one. Arrival time and scheduled arrival time, those might not help much. Um, scheduled arrival time will have the, the, the same information as the departure time, more or less, right? Um, and the arrival time, the actual arrival time is dangerous here because remember, if you have the arrival time, for example, and the scheduled arrival time, you will actually be able to give the model 100% um, uh, prediction because the model is going to say, oh, if I take this variable and I deduct the other variable, that's the exact arrival delay. So that is another thing you have to be careful with, right? Variables that are actually 100% correlated, right? Or even a difference between two variables that are 100% correlated with your target. So we're not using these guys. Um, actual elapsed time and a scheduled elapsed time, the actual elapsed time plus the departure delay would actually potentially give you part of the arrival delay. So you, you also don't want to use that. You want to choose one. So I, I'll, I picked the uh, scheduled elapsed time because it's okay. Again, it's, you know, how, how long is the flight, right? In minutes. Um, unique carrier, origin and destination. Definitely that makes sense. We're going to try to use um, flight number. As we saw, it's a little too, too many little, you know, uh, number, a small number of flights. So that's too granular. That, that might not make sense for our model. So we're not going to use it. Distance, sure, makes sense, right? It might be interesting. Cancel and diverted flights. We're going to remove those flights from here. Departure delay, again, we saw it. It's the most useful, right? And most correlated variable. So we're going to use it. And then finally, the arrival delay, right? Which is our target. So uh, we're going to remove some outliers for sure. So we're removing these. Um, outliers or removing flights that were canceled and flights that were diverted as well. And then 
We're going to drop the attributes we don't use. We're going to remove this with drop, right? We're going to remove these columns that we're not using. Now let's take a look at the new distribution of arrival delay. So when you look at the new distribution of arrival delay, now this is looking much better, right? So uh, this looks more like something that you say, oh, that makes sense. So everyone is mostly centered in zero, right? So most flights make it on time, right? Many flights make it a little earlier or a little later. And then a few flights get, you know, much earlier and then much uh, later, right? So delayed all the way to 60 minutes because we, we, we uh, clipped it at 60, right? So that, that looks a little better. And then remember the transformations, right? So we're going to transform the departure time. So we just need to divide it by 100 and floor it so that we can cut out the minutes. So we keep the, uh, convert that into departure hours. And um, so we're going to delete uh, a table. We're going to create actually a new physical table because now we're going to pass that to the next, um, to the next, um, uh, sorry, we'll create a view. To the, we're going to pass this new view to the next um, notebook. So right here, we delete if the view called on time CL exists. Otherwise, we're going to take the on time clean. We're going to drop departure time. We're going to add the new departure hour. And then we're going to create a view uh, with that name. And when we do that, uh, we actually create the physical view to the database. So instead of being just uh, like this guy, which was a uh, proxy object, right? A temporary view that if I cancel or I, I click and, and shut down my session here, it's going to disappear uh, because it's temporary. Right now, what I'm doing here with the create view is actually creating that view physically. And I can take a look at the new uh, view that I just created, right? Uh, and then you can see that now I have this departure hour, right? In the hours, okay? So um, finally, we're gonna convert the floats uh, into characters. So we're gonna actually run a query here uh, and uh, we run a SQL query with the two char just to convert that those guys to characters and to simplify the name. So instead of day of week, I just call it D-O-W uh, and then the day of month to D-O-M and then from that view that I just created above, right? So now I do the sync creating that query. And now I'm going to drop a new view called CLTR. And I create this view now so that I can pick it up from the other side. So the data is going to look the same, but the column types are different. This time the column types are going to be, um, you know, these this, uh, this columns are going to be um, now strings, OK? So we go to the second one. So now the second section, uh, we already had that basic data preparation transformation. What we're going to do here is some data visualization, understanding of data, some cleaning and transformations as well, and, and then split into training and test. So we're going to look into, um, again, same thing, initializing the environment. Now we pick up that view that I just created in the other section. And um, I'm going to create now a local copy of that, right? So again, I'm, I'm bringing locally a copy of that, a sample, right? That you can use a fraction of that sample. Because now I'm going to do a lot of charting, a lot of charts using, um, uh, using a Python, right? So let's take a look at, again, departure. Um, uh, and, uh, delays and arrival delays. And we saw this the last time, right? So this is the distribution. You see that there is some good um, indication that these guys are related, right? Um, because of that diagonal that, that grows into that direction. And, um, but let's take a look at other columns. So for example, distance, right? And um, I see that distance does not really give me a good indication, right? It doesn't go up or down here. It's like, if you, if you get a straight line over here, you will be okay, right? Thinking that this th there's not really a difference between, you know, the larger the distance, the more the delay, because there is like a delay over here, there's, there's delay over there, right? So there's not really a lot going on for distance for us. So I'm not sure that's going to be very useful for us. Uh, we take a look at departure hour. And um, when we look at this, then... Uh, you can see that um, the 
there is not a lot as well going on in terms of there there are delays on all the hours of the day uh of course overnight right at at, at three in the morning four in the morning five in the morning here uh but before like between one and four there are not a lot of flights anyway uh, there are a few flights that but even then you know you have a, a, a small delay uh, 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 actually arriving early, but then a, a long delay. So there's not really a, a good pattern to go with over here. Um, and these are the things that you got, you have to do, right? It's, it's, it's a good exercise for us to look at. The models are going to do it for you behind the scenes, but I think it's important for data scientists to actually understand what's going on in the variables, right? Before we can just push them uh, into the models. So here again, as the same thing, right? The departure year. And actually, the, I have another problem with the ear um, that we're going to see afterwards. But the problem with the ear is that, you know, this guy goes to 2014, right, the data. The problem is now it's 2020. What happens with my model, right, when I throw a 2020 ear in the, in the data, right? The model, if the model was using ear, it was not going to know what to do. So... It is com more complicated for sure to use that kind of uh, variable, right? So year might not even be an interesting variable to use to begin with, um, even if it's converted right to strings like I did now. Um, and then departure month. So the months might have some difference, but it's not really clear here. You see uh, maybe August being a little less delays than the others, but this might not even be significant. So. Again, maybe a model can find some more patterns mixing a few variables with the others. So we're going to check that. Um, and the day of the month, that probably has less significance as well. Maybe the first day of the month, you get less delays. I don't know, people might be happier, so flying more on schedule just because they're starting the month, I guess. But other than that, it's kind of hard, right? So um, there are data all over the place. Uh, and then finally, the weekdays. So weekdays, you know, if this is probably Friday, um, I, I, I would actually guess the opposite. I would guess Fridays are, are some of the most complicated ones. So maybe this is Saturday. But, um, but anyway, th that's, that's what we get on, on these times of the day. Um, scheduled, right? The schedule elapsed time. So the longer the time of the flight, I would have expected that potentially they could have more delay, but not really, right? Because the end, you, you can have a short flight, but if you're in a region like Florida and you have hurricane coming in, it's going to be complicated, right? Weather-wise. So if you go into Chicago, you have a snowstorm, same thing there. So there's a lot of, there's not really a, a great um, representation here. You can see again, this is probably more like if you, if you were to run a straight line, it will be around zero here. So it wouldn't give you uh, any helps, right? So what we're going to do now is then split the data into training and test. And then we can take a look at that data, right? So again, I, it's, it's interesting to look at the data uh, the, after splitting because you, you want to have the training data the model uses to build to be similar to the data that the model is going to be um, running predictions. So you want to just have those guys in similar distributions. And because the departure delay was one of the most important variables, I'm just using it again here just to illustrate that. So it, it seems uh, to be reasonable, right? So now I create the tables for these guys, right? So I take my uh, train and test, and I actually will materialize them. So I'll pick up the cleaned and the transformed data that I work with, and these were all views, right, all the time. But now I split those views into two sections, the training and test, and now I'm gonna materialize them and create them as tables. So that guy is gonna be part of that, uh, of that process, okay? So then we finish that, this section, and we're gonna move into the next one. Okay, so uh, basically on the, on the third uh, section here, of our work, we're gonna do the uh, model build, right? So that's the current notebook is now the reg regression model build. We're gonna do model building, feature selection, and generation for linear regression in particular, but then goodness of fit statistics, 
visualization of actual versus uh, predicted and the residuals. And then we'll do a ranking of all models. So same thing again, we, we just initialize the environment. We're gonna synchronize the views, right? Or the tables created before, right? So now I get the table from a train and the table from test. Um, and then I'm gonna create the temporary X and Ys, right? So now these are um, actual proxies, right? The X and Y becomes a proxy to uh, the, the, the data, right? The tables that we got, the training and test data. And then we're gonna start model building. So first things first, we run a, a regression, right? So just the same thing again as before, on time training X, train Y with a case ID, and then we run the predictions and we get uh, the supplemental columns for now, departure delay and arrival delay, just to, just to check, right? Um, so uh, just, again, just as before, you see the, the results here, but now in this case, the, uh, you're gonna see that you have many more coefficients, right? So now you can see that every coefficient, for example, departure hour zero, departure hour one, each of these guys have a specific coefficient. So what it tells you, because it's a linear regression, so there, there is a relationship between them that is direct between the target, right, the arrival delay, and each of these coefficients, right? So this guy is going to tell you that you have a negative estimate with a departure hour zero, which means if you departed at midnight, then you are more likely to actually arrive, arrive earlier. Now, if you departed at 1 a.m., for some reason, you are actually going to arrive a little later in average. Same thing is gonna happen with the other columns, including the year, right? So the year, again, as I mentioned before, it's probably not a great variable to, to be using in the first place, but if you could use something like this, it would tell you, you know, the year X has a coefficient, you know, this is more negative than the other coefficient. So these coefficients, you can compare them between them, but this is not odds ratio, right? So this guy's not like, oh, you got minus one minute in average. That's not, that's not exactly it, okay? Now, uh, if you look at what, how the prediction looks like, if you guys remember, we had for predicted versus actuals um, uh, for arrival delay, so we had actually, departure and arrival, and then we have the model. And the model before was a straight line, right? It was just a little line over here. Now, because I'm using more variables than this, this guy, right? Now I can see what the model can do. So you can see that the model is actually going out of the normal straight line, right? And, and being capable of, of capturing much more of that data, right? So uh, again, this is because I'm looking at this in two dimensions. I'm gonna look at this in three dimensions later, but for now, looking at this in two dimensions, I could be looking at what are the most important variables as well. So we're gonna go into that, right? Now, as a general rule, right, it's good to look at arrival, uh, at the actual versus predicted, right? So you are trying to predict the arrival delay. So this is the arrival delay, this is the prediction, right? So coming out of that, that uh, prediction, data set, right? So that whatever was predicted um, before using that model, right? So you can basically see that if, if, if the model was perfect, it was gonna be a 45 degree line here, right? The model is gonna say, every time I have a zero arrival delay, I would predict zero, right? Every time there is a 20 arrival delay, I would predict 20. If it's 40, I would predict 40, right? So ideally it would have been very, very much on into this uh, diagonal, but it is not. And you see there's some curve here happening. So every time these kinds of things happen, that means you probably don't have the, var the right variables that you wanted, uh, that you were looking for. Uh, you might have a problem with uh, quadratic relationships. And um, so, so normally you, you can, start thinking about other types of models or changing your input attributes as well. Same thing happens with the residuals. When you look at a, a residuals chart like this, you can see that actually they start with a wide variability range here, 
and then they go and diminish, right? So they reduce the variability. So the more arrival delay you go, uh, the more uh, the, the more uh, tight the residuals are, right? So it looks like you have the model is having mu much more trouble predicting uh, things that are almost on time, right? Versus things that are um, going on uh, to have a longer delays. Again, that's just one model, right? So what we're going to do is we're going to just run the uh, basic uh, goodness of fit statistics. And if we run them, actually, we see that it's already better than the previous model. So when we only use one column, we had a, a, um, a mean absolute error uh, that was like eight point something. So it was superior to this one. This is, this is looking a little better. Now, let's take a look at one other fun model, which is uh, I'm just going to get the same model, but I'm going to tell it, okay, you know what? Uh, you can do some, um, you can run some feature selection and feature generation. So I'm going to let the model go wild and create new columns for me as needed. So the model comes out, and I see the, the output here, but then the model comes out, shows me, you know, I can see the settings that were used um, and things like that. And then, um, what I'm going to look at is the coefficients, and I'm interested in the coefficients because I look at the coefficients. And now, now these are coefficients that the model created itself. So look at this thing. He created a new feature that is actually the departure delay to the square multiplied by the elapsed time. Now, definitely that is not intuitive at all, um, but it it found that this variable was interesting for, for the, for, you know, for, to be in here, right? Other things that it found that were interesting, destination Newark, uh, day of the week six, um, uh, one of the airports as origin. And now this guy, which is also very interesting. So it's saying, if it's the month of November, and if you're flying United Airlines, then you're gonna get, you know, knock down. You're definitely going to get a little more delay than what you're expecting. So, um, because that is, uh, you know, that's coming back like that, right? I wanted to to show us. Okay, let's take a deeper look into the the coefficients themselves, and you can extract the coefficients like this, so they look a little better when you're when you're looking at them, right? Um, and you're trying to understand what's going on. But then I said, okay, what, what would happen, right? What can, you know, how can we use these models, right, for, for predictions? So you can uh, run the predictions, the normal predictions, and, and see what the model is doing. And it doesn't seem to be doing much better than the previous one. But again, this is a completely, you know, uh, non-interesting view, right, of the model. It's a, it's a 2D view of a model going with one of the columns, right? But let's check the features that were created. So we can now take that departure delay, multiply it by itself again, and multiply it by elapsed time, and just look what it does against arrival delay so that we can understand. And then the same thing on the right-hand side, right? So uh, on here, you see departure delay to the square multiplied by elapsed time versus departure delay uh, or arrival delay, actually. So uh, in here, uh, I don't see a lot of patterns, but yeah, it looks like it tried to compress some of these things and try to identify some of the other, uh, particularly with long delays, right? With uh, uh, a, a larger, the larger these arrival delay, it looked like the, the you know, the longer this uh, particular component was. So uh, again, models will try to squeeze everything that they can out of uh, um, out of your data, right? So this is what this algorithm is doing in this case with feature creation. And on the right-hand side, you see, you know, if we limit the carriers to United Airlines and the month to 11, what happens then, right, with the departure delay? So you see that now you have a, an interesting pattern here. So with this case, it's potentially easier for the model to predict something that it would be would have been like a straight line. So the model can say, you know what, I, I can guess better the, a straight line over here and I can understand better your 
an estimate bet or your arrival delay when you limit that guy. So these, again, these are just interesting things for you to look at. Um, I, I highly recommend visualizing this, especially when you get these strange features, especially if you want to use them. Now, of course, looking at uh, a three level, right? So these are two, uh, two and, and, and the third level here uh, features, right? That were generating like cubic terms like these might be dangerous because they might be just too um, delicate, right? Uh, so you, you probably want to test them in several different uh, data sets uh, or chunks of that data set before you actually commit to them, right? Um, but you, you also, if you do, if you identify them, you will need to explain them, right? So it might be important for you to use that. And the goodness of it actually shows that the model is a little better than the first one. And, and again, it makes sense because we used feature selection, right? So going over the other models, uh, again, uh, support vector machine, right? Linear, um, you get a Gaussian again. Um, you get a Gaussian with a complexity factor that I chose, which, you know, 0 0.1. So that, that looks like curvy, right? Very strange and curvy here. Uh, neural networks, right? So neural networks are very capable. So they, they will go and dance all around. Um, but again, the number of, of, uh, of goodness of feet here is not great. So it looks like it's dancing too much. And the more layers you put, right, the more complexity you add, then um, the less they work, right? So they, they, they don't get great at, prediction, at predicting that output. So at the end of the day, in this list of models, then these are the top models, right? So we get the linear regression cubic squared models with feature selection. That was the guy that we were just looking at with those crazy columns that is giving me uh, a better uh, mean absolute error, um, a better root mean square error, right? Compared to the other models. So that's interesting for sure, right? I'm not sure if I would have, I would use it, um, but it's quite simple enough, um, but you can probably continue to study that and compare it maybe against an SVM Gaussian, for example. But at the end of the day, what I'm going to do here is I'm going to store the results now on a table. These results that I'm looking at, this little table here, I'm going to store that on a table, a physical table on the Oracle database, so then I can pick it up and use it with my, um, with my next um, notebook. This last notebook talks about the AutoML. Uh, we're going to test the two top algorithms indicated by AutoML, right? Because AutoML, remember, it will show me a ranking of algorithms. And we're going to check the full ranking of these models, including AutoML, and then run a final diagnostics on that and try to understand the attribute importance of the model. So again, same thing. I initialize my environment. I synchronize my tables, right? With a training and test, the same tables I was using before. I create my, my uh, train X and my train Y same thing with tests that I was using before. And now I run my AutoML. So remember, before I ran the AutoML regression, uh, I was using the same mean squared error as my score metric. Again, I have R squared. I have several other metrics that I can use and choose. The default is R, R squared. Um, and then I'm going to just pass it the train X and the train Y, in my case, ID. So it comes back and tells me that the best ranked models here it found was a neural network and then the second was a svm gaussian so that's interesting because the svm gaussian was the second best for us as well but neural network was definitely far from perfect right at least the ones that i was doing by hand so let's say okay uh so show me why so let's take a look at the a neural network so now i'm passing uh, a, a regression again using the mean squared error and i want to first uh, try to find a feature selection. So I'm going to reduce the neural networks. Again, tell me, take me uh, X and Y with case ID. It's going to reduce the features, right? So I, it's going to end up with the selected features for neural networks. Now, I need to add the ID, right? Because I just wanted to make sure that the column ID is there as well. Um, that's uh, that's that's basically what I was forgetting before because otherwise I get a list of the features, right? Like departure delay, unique carrier, 
uh, elapsed time and distance. And if I forget to add the ID as a column, I might filter it out and I don't have ID next on my next uh, execution, right? So I'm, I'm adding ID there and I'm filtering out. So now I'm reducing my original training data set only to these ones that were found useful. I tune now my neural network model. I tune it using the reduced set. And uh, this is the final neural network. So uh, the final model for the neural network uh, was a little bit different, right, than mine. My original one, I was doing uh, several hidden layers. If you remember, I was doing, I was doing several hidden layers and I was trying to do the uh, hyperbolic tangent um, and then using other sigmoids, right, and, and binomial sigmoid distributions. Well, it actually, these guys told me, okay, you know what, the best model you're gonna get uh, uh, with a linear activations and actually 200 uh, iterations and 37 nodes. So it says, you know what? You can use a lot more uh, using these 37 different neurons on that uh, layer. So that's good. That's, that's, uh, that's an interesting uh, uh, you know, twist, right? And it's gonna use all these attributes. So, uh, okay, let's take a look at how that model fared. So uh, we can take a look at again, uh, the predictions. So we're going to predict my tuned neural network model uh, and we're going to plot it. So the plot seems okay, right? Not not overly complicated, right? Like my neural networks, which were going all, all the way trying to predict these things. Uh, and when we look at the model statistics, uh, this is excellent. Actually, this is this is the top one. So this is very, very good. Then I'm going to also let it run uh, my SV DSVM Gaussian, right? Because it also ranked that as the second model. So I, you know, I decided to run a feature selection on it. And um, maybe not to my surprise, but in terms of this the reduction of features, it actually reduced everything to just departure delay. So um, yeah, that was, you know, I guess expected. And, and of course, if you do a graph, for that uh, model, right? You tune it and you do a graph for that model because you have only one uh, input, right? It's gonna be a straight line. Um, so yeah, it's not as great as the other model for sure. Um, but let's take a look at the final ranking, right? So the final ranking for all models here now. So I got the tuned auto ML neural network actually beats everyone else, right? So that was a great call by the, the auto ML in this case. And then I have also the tuned AutoML SVM Gaussian, which is pretty close to the one that I crazily stopped at 0.1 a complexity factor. But maybe that just helped a little bit with, the, um, uh, with not getting too complicated. But again, uh, I think this shows the, the, the kind of uh, features that I was looking for. Because if you look at my neural networks, right, that I did by hand, they were really horrible, right? They were the worst uh, models here. So it's good to know that I can count on AutoML here on neural networks to, to help me figure out these things, right? And understand what can I do there. Now, once you understand that model, remember neural networks might be uh, more complex, right? So one thing I can do, again, I wanna look at the arrival delay versus predicted, right? And I wanna look at the things like residuals, right? So I can clearly see that, you know, if this line is a straight line of 45 degree, right, the black line, then I can clearly see that there are still a chunk of missing things, right? This is not really straight. There might be something that it's, it's, it's a curve here. There might be something that is helping me, right? That there might be some other confounding effect, right? So this clearly tells me there's something missing, right? Something amazing. It looks like there is, there should be like a straight line over here and then there's a curve over there. So there might be something else, right? That is confounding this. And I can see that more clearly here on the right when I look at the residuals, right? So the residuals chart, when they show a, a clear decay like that, that to me means there is definitely something um, wrong, right? There's something that I'm not able to see right, with the data that I have, with the attributes that I have, right? So uh, a, a good thing to do here, at least to start, is 
the attribute importance, right? So we have a this machine learning explainability that can actually help us understand the attributes and the importance of the attributes for the model itself. This is not a just generic attribute importance. This is a specific attribute importance for the model that was built. So for that tuned neural network model, we're gonna see uh, the global feature importance. And now it shows me that, of course, departure delay, because we saw it before as one of the most important ones, but then the neural network is actually thinking that the elapsed time was helping, then the distance, and then the unique carrier actually was helpful for it, right? Even though not as, you know, the weight of that is not as much, but it still is trying to help and it's giving us some, some help there. So I thought it was also interesting for us to take a look at uh, visualizing those in 3D, right? Because we keep talking about these charts and, you know, you have at least three, right? Three, three or four different components here. So let's take a look at these two, the two top ones and compare that with the arrival delay to see if we can see any patterns and then use the model there. So uh, I predict the models and remember that when I was predicting, I was only bringing back the uh, departure delay. So now I bring back also this, the two top columns there or right, the three top ones there. Uh, and then I can now visualize that, uh, for example, as dot and the model as dots or the model as surface. So now I can see what the model is estimating versus how the data looks like. And you can go with dots. I think it's reasonable. Sometimes a surface would look okay, but this surface is very rough. So it might not help us visualize too much. And uh, especially 3D things, you, you might want to look at in different angles. So I, I, you know, I'm plotting the dots from different angles to try to look and understand. So you can see that you know this, this side, it looks almost like okay, but when you look at over the top, you can see that it's not really a great uh, fit, right? So that those, dot, those black dots are not really fitting well, the, the reds. And also from below, um, this is probably a little better, right? But we, you still have things that are outside. So anyways, as, you know, as final conclusions here, I think that um, data preparation is key. We saw that the domain knowledge, right, is, is very important when you're looking at this. Uh, for data analysis and investigation, um, these are critical things you gotta do before the model, right? Before you throw things into a model, think about the, the attributes very well. So unless these are, you know, 2000 sensors out of a machine that you know that these sensors are measuring normal things, um, but even then, right, always think about the problem. Think about, uh, are the sensors far apart? Are the sensors at the same time? Is the sensor, you know, uh, one uh, mile from the other? So the time that you're measuring things are different. So all of these things are, you have to take into account. Uh, number three, I think you, you have to run several model families for sure. I mean, it's, it is important to play with and run as many models as you can uh, before you dig deeper into one model, right, and start evaluating it. Uh, because otherwise it might take too much time from you and you might be on the wrong way, right, on the, on, on the wrong road to the best model. Uh, I, I would also check um, uh, AutoML since I can give you a great model, right, using settings uh, you did not think about. Um, and the work never ends, right? You never stop improving your model. There's no end in sight, right? When you start a project like this, it's normal to start a project and then keep going and then you get a conclusion, you keep going and then there's always the next best model, the next best attribute I could add. So as a homework, I would like you to think about what are the other things that could help in our prediction? How about, you know, maybe weather data on the departure and arrival cities, right? Maybe the airplane years in service, right? Would that help? What are the other things that you guys can think of, right? Because some of this data uh, is definitely public. So it is something you could fetch and, uh, and try to grab and add into on top of this. 
So having said that, um, so basically we'd like to um, open up um, uh, for questions. Thanks, Marcus. It was a great session. Um, we have one question remaining. How long did AutoML take to come up with these results? Oh, that's a, that's a great question. So it's, it's actually back down here. Let me see, where is it? So to, my, to get to my best model, so let's say my, my best uh, tuned model neural network, you're going to see it over, um, where was I? Uh, my, uh, there you go. So my neural network tuning, it took a minute and 30 seconds in this, um, in this case. And then to run all the models and compare all against everything, it took 24 seconds to get to the best ranking ones here. Okay. Mm -hmm. But it's going to really depend um, of the size of the data set or the complexity of the number of columns you throw in, right? Uh, but for sure, that's, that's uh, I mean, I, I, will, I, I would love to spend you know, 20 seconds that it gets me to go to my kitchen and get, grab a cup of coffee, right? And, and come back and already have that listing of models uh, for myself. I think that's very useful. Okay. Um, all right, well, the only other question that uh, showed up, uh, I think that you already addressed was that, you know, there's a lot of data standardizing and cleansing and categorization of attributes versus metric types and, uh, how uh, much effort goes into the data preparation process? Do we use a lot of pandas or other mechanisms? And I think that you, know, you largely covered that and certainly in your uh, conclusions. Do you want to add anything to that, Marcus? Yes, I, I think um, I would say that it's, it is very critical. So the, the better, the, the more you can do on the data preparation, the better for your model, right? So there is, um, normally you would probably say maybe 90% of the time, of any data science project is going to be data capture, data transformation, data cleansing, right? And only 10% of the time is really the, the fun part, which is the model, <laughs> the model generation and creation. Um, and and, and it, it's been true for, you know, 20 years doing machine learning algorithms and playing with models and going at uh, projects with customers. It's been, you know, true all the time, right? So it's very rare for you to be able to capture um, have you know very little data cleansing and just throw garbage in and see what happens mm -hmm. because mo more often than not you're going to see a lot of garbage out as well the model doesn't know better any better right so the model is going to pick up a year and if it's going to think it's a number and it's going to say oh yeah 2019 i multiplied by x and then now you're going to throw in 2020 and the model is going to say sure it's a number so i'm uh, now adding you know one on top and it's it doesn't make any sense, right? Mm -hmm. So you really have to pay attention and know your data uh, well before you can actually um, run these models. I mean, I would suggest uh, for sure to pay a lot of attention. All right, well, I think with that, then we may be um, all set. Uh, Suresh, uh, you have an additional question? Uh, I was just uh, wondering how is SVM used uh, in regression? Typically, SVM is used in classification, right? So just uh, wondering about that. Typically, regression would be, like you said, neural net and uh, uh, linear regression. All right. So, so yeah, so I think you're asking about the methodology, right? The method itself. Yeah. So we, ha we actually have for both. So we have um, the uh, support vector machines regression. Uh, available and we mm -hmm. have support vector machine uh, classification and we actually have um, the unsupervised support vector machine as well which actually does um, uh, we, we use it for uh, or, or we would call it a one class uh, SVM so we, okay. it is supervised but only one class which we use normally for fraud detection right and things along those lines so um, mm -hmm. uh, outlier detection um, uh, along those lines mm -hmm. so the Oracle machine learning has uh, a support vector uh, machine for regression for sure uh, available. Oh, okay. So, and, so and we, we have... just select, we select SVM and it just selects on its own which, which particular SVM to use? Oh, yes. It, 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 yes. Okay. So it will do that. But normally um, what, I, what I do here, when I do that uh, in, my, um, in my runs here, 
what I do when my, my runs is, is I go here in the uh, support vector machine and I actually tell it uh, it is a regression. So I say, hey, you know, it's a SVM oh. regression. Oh. And then I, but, but even if I didn't do it, it would do it automatically because it would detect that my, my, um, my target is actually uh, a numerical. It's not a, a binomial target, right? Mm. So it would actually automatically detect that and, and make that, um, that process okay. for you. Thank you, Marcus. Sure. Mark, can you hear me? Yes. I had trouble unmuting myself, so I know you're closing off the call, but I'll take two minutes of your time, much easier Go than ahead. email. Mark, uh, I had a question when I was introducing this in academic field, and the counterpoint for using human intelligence into domain knowledge is, yeah, well, the machine learning usually is introduced when you have to learn something about which you don't know. So the question was, well, why do you just throw every column at the machine learning and let it select the best features and work on it? Mm -hmm. Perfect. Why, Perfect. Should, why should we as human beings interfere in feature selection or messing with? Uh... Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. And, and, and I think it's, it's probably the most, <laughs> one of the most asked questions, right, around machine learning. When we think about machine learning, we think that it's more like magical than actually is, right? So um, when you think about machine learning, what you have to, to, to say is that the algorithm is only going to learn what makes sense out of the data if you actually feed it things that make sense. For example, I can feed uh, the color of the eyes of my customers to an algorithm, right? Because I don't know any better, right? I can yeah. feed a shoe size, right, of my customers. If I do not have enough customers for that to not matter, maybe the algorithm is gonna find that the shoe size of the customer actually matters, you know? The guy with a larger shoe size uh, suddenly has correlations with uh, things that are related to fraud. Uh, so, you know, the next time I see my customer, I gotta look down and, and and start measuring feet, right? Or, or measuring the shoe size of people. So the problem with letting the algorithm do whatever it wants to do is always the garbage, right? Because you can enter, end up entering garbage in and then get the garbage out. In this case, today, what I was showing is you throw something like a, a day of the week, right? That was yeah. numerical data, one to seven but the model doesn't know any better. So the algorithm is going to say, sure, give me, give me that. To me then means Sunday is seven times more important than Monday. And Tuesday is twice more important than Monday. And the algorithm doesn't know any better because it doesn't know these are categories. It thinks it's a number. So there are a few things that if you just let the algorithm pick, it might not pick the right things for you. So when it's time for you to explain the reasons why these algorithm picked up these variables, it, it then might not make sense, right? So that's the danger of, um, so what I'm saying is the domain knowledge, it's still critical, right? It is still very important for a data scientist to work with the business analyst and the business person and the product manager, right? Because th only then you have a cohesive you know, a target finding, right? Yeah. So we wish that the algorithms were going to be as smart as we are, and maybe one day they will, right? But it's not, we're not there yet. So we, we really need to massage the data, understand the data. And then, yes, you can feed, as you saw, I can feed a lot of stuff to AutoML, and it will identify the variables and the columns for me. But I had to work on those columns, right? before feeding it so so that's the idea okay thank you i will work with you offline yeah and just a, one other point to add is that um you know in some cases if you're just throwing all of the data that you have at it it will as marco said pick what's there but there's also engineered features right in which case you need the domain knowledge to say how do i craft a new uh uh, variable that I should feed into this. So it's something as simple as uh, date of birth and you want to get age from that. Um, maybe they're, they're not going to be treated uh, equivalently. And uh, another aspect is temporal 
uh, dependencies in the data. Suppose if your uh, data that you're feeding the algorithm uh, has a data point that is only known after the fact, bef uh, after um, you know, you know what the, the outcome of something uh, actually is, but then when you go to predict, that value uh, isn't there. So uh, in that case, you would need to understand that um, your model might have done very well on the training data because you threw this data at it and said, oh, this one variable that uh, uh, exists in the training data works very well. But when you go to predict, you don't have that. And all of a sudden your predictions aren't uh, doing nearly as well as uh, on the training data. So you know, those are the types of things one also has to be aware of through uh, domain knowledge. Okay, thanks Mark and Marcos. I will touch base with you offline. Final closing remarks. Let us say you have 10 columns and you get a certain root mean square error when you predict. Is it possible that when you add column 11 and column 12, your root mean square will increase because column 11 and 12 are not helpful? Uh, yes, it is, it, and it depends on the model. So if, you, okay. if your model does not do a good job of feature selection, sometimes you, you can get that, but um, it is unlikely, I would say, because even, even a, a simple linear regression might actually give the, if, the, if that variable is not useful, the a linear regression could give it a coefficient of zero and just, okay. just leave the variable way down there, right? So yeah. uh, it is unlikely, but yes, if you, know, if you start adding 100 features and the model does not do feature selection by itself, then you might get in trouble for sure. And that's okay. the motivation of AutoML as well, right? We have the, the second phase of that is automatic feature selection. And with auto feature selection, it's trying to reduce the number of variables to eliminate noise, as well as potentially improve performance. But it's really to eliminate noise and produce a better model. Okay, I'll catch base with you offline. I've taken enough time. Thank you, guys. Very useful. And I believe we had uh, A. Dana uh, had a question. Thank you very much for for the talk. I, I I really like it, and I just wanted to add something. I have seen many times uh, uh, data scientists so excited at the beginning of. Uh, uh, training a model and saying my model is so good is it has 99% accuracy and it's actually because there is a data leak and the problem is because you really have to look at the features you are putting there otherwise you might go into the problem that you are putting something that shouldn't be there it's just something that um, it's not a predictor it's basically the, the the target you want to predict so just wanted to add that comment Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yes. And, and that happens a lot. I mean, uh, there, there are many, inclu including in this problem, um, uh, originally when I threw all the columns at it, uh, that was actually what happened. So you get 100% because the, uh, the uh, arrival time and the uh, scheduled arrival time, right, will actually, that difference will give you the arrival delay. So it's 100% correlated with the target and the models will pick it up and, and just say, sure. Your model is amazing, uh, but you don't realize that by the time you know you need to predict this, those two columns are not going to be available to you, right? So exactly, you're right. That that's um, that that happens a lot for sure when, in the beginning. Mm -hmm. okay. uh, Tom asked the question in uh, the Q and A: Are residuals most applicable to neural network models or in other situations? So the residuals are, are actually good to be studied by any models. And in this case, uh, I was looking at just, uh, I looked at the linear regression in the beginning, and then I looked at the residuals for my best model, which happened to be a neural network right at the end. But it is important for you to look at the residuals all the time because they will tell you if there is something missing, right? And you saw that we had that curve um, so that you can clearly see there's some, some sort of a, a quadratic, uh, approach that might be needed, some sort of an additional data that might be needed. So that's why I was suggesting weather data, uh, the age of the plane and other things. But yeah, it's very important to look at, at the residuals when you're, um, when you're working on this, right? Um, this is something that I don't see a lot of people looking at. Many times they're just satisfied with the model quality and the model fit. And then they go on not really knowing uh, that they could be, you know, looking at trouble, right? So I, I think it's definitely uh, something important to look at on, on any models you build, on any regression models you build. Mm -hmm. yep. 
Uh, any last uh, questions? Okay, well, once again, Marcos, thank you for the session and uh, everyone for attending and we'll see you next time. Thank you, everyone.